Good morning and welcome to Thoughts and Updates. It's me and the gnome, just about there, um, out celebrating an incredible week, a week in which Scotland, the football team, the national men's team, have managed to make it to the Euro 2020 finals. Um, in for my writing for the Scottish Football Supporters Association this week, I have been musing upon how a manager who was a mid-table Premier League manager has managed to get us there. Before that, it was the manager of Clyde. And before that, a guy who had never even managed a team. And yet, we still have people suggesting there's a possibility that former managers of English Premier League clubs and Rangers or Celtic would do a job for us. Now, what you need is a guy who's uh, used to losing, used to struggling, used to trying to put together a team on the park who's going to beat the big boys, not be the big boys. And I think in Steve Clapp we've got exactly that. Also, I have um, a little bit of a scurrilous nonsense. What can you do in that kind of week in order to take the mickey out of Scottish football? You can't. So it's about fans and getting ready for a Euro finals, which is the first time that that has happened for 23 years. Also, yesterday, Air United managed through penalties to win their League Cup group and progress into the final 16. Uh, they did so in penalties against Renard. The second time they've done this against Renard, they won in penalties in order to gain promotion into the Championship a few years ago, and Leila and I were there to witness it. It's been an interesting time this week in terms of football. In terms of boxing, the three uh, women's world title fights last night all went to the British fighter and all went to British fighters in fairly convincing fashion, given the fact that over the last few weeks, men's boxing has provided lots and lots of different um, comp computations, permutations, and indeed shocks. That in itself was a shock too. So what we've ended up with is we've ended up with three very, very good um, female world champions and the opportunity for bigger fights, particularly for Katie Taylor. Now, I've said British, one of, of course is Katie Taylor who happens to be Irish and that's wrong. She's not British, she's Irish, but we consider her not one of our own, but certainly one that we thoroughly admire because Katie Taylor has done more for British boxing and indeed boxing than many other fighters have done for many, many years. She's fought in the UK, she's fought in America, um, did so against Delphine Pursun, again in, uh, sorry, in Madison Square Gardens. And that is something which was unthinkable when the likes of Jane Couch, who was the figurehead of women's boxing in this, this country, um, would never have been able to contemplate. But also what came out this week was the price that's being paid. I don't mean that it's a cost on boxing as a sport, but the price, the money that's being paid over to female boxers. It's not commensurate with male boxing. And that's because the commercialism that is associated with male boxing is not quite at the same level for female boxing. Fingers crossed that that's not going to be the same forever. And certainly three world title fights should push that through the ceiling. Um, Heather Hardy, one of the professional female boxers, has come out and said the reason you're getting lots of female boxers on uh, shows just now is because they're cheaper. And there's certainly an argument in there and one that boxing has to um, address. So no reviewing this week, although I've got a few things to look at. Um, one from Manchester's home and one from Traverse 3, which um, I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, also the National Theatre Scotland one and one from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland which is great to see that they also are putting stuff online. The back eye is there. Findon Hertog is the director of guy I worked with at Scottish Youth Theatre. So looking forward to that. Also for Ringside Report, look back at the career of Tony Bellew and what's going to happen when Trump finally does go and how do you heal the wounds that he has exploited over the last four years years. That's an interesting one, a really fascinating one because the way in which um, Trump has exploited the fears of a white working class vote, the Latino vote, and I, I talk about how you know you can section it up, you can start to play to one or to the other, and American politics is particularly good at that, that you divide people up into categories so that you play to one audience or another, and what America needs, in my opinion, is to play to no gallery whatsoever, but to do the right thing. 
to find a way to reintroduce the ideals of liberal democracy and liberalism that um, were held so close and so dear by so many for so long. Not socialism, as Trump would have it, because the socialism he suggests that Joe Biden is responsible for doesn't actually exist in the way that he is suggesting. So, what we end up with is we end up with a fractured community, with a fractured sense of itself, with a fractured ideology. And the only way to heal that is to forgive. People voted for Trump who are reasonable, honourable, normal people. 70 odd million people in the United States are not all completely and utterly nuts. They've done so through a, a variety of different reasons. And it's the same in the United Kingdom with Brexit and with voting against Scottish independence. There are people who have fears which have been preyed upon by the likes of Nigel Farage, the likes of Donald Trump. But the time has come for us to heal that, to look at how we bring those people back in to our fold. And that has been the focus of some of my writing this week. Also, Donald Trump in the not-so-White House and the not-so-Oval Office refusing to hear things and in changing the way he hears things. So when people say there's none of this, he says, oh, there must be some of that. And that seems to be the way in which his legacy is going to be defined. So let it be defined like that. So this week what I've learned also is I looked at the six hours or so of the trials and life of Oscar Pistorius. An excellent documentary in so many ways, apart from not really telling the story of Reva Steenkamp not really giving her the airtime that she deserves. Particularly towards the end, I think we can be very critical of the fact that a lot of this was about Oscar Pistorius, but the woman that he murdered, the woman that he killed, uh, particularly at the end when they covered the change in the Court of Appeal, overturning the verdict and then overturning the sentence, was kind of rushed through, and I thought that uh, Eva Steenkamp and uh, her family deserved a little more. But outside of that, the rest of it was compelling, thrilling. Did he know he was going to murder her? Well, the Court of Appeal decided it didn't matter. He knew that what he was doing by discharging the firearm was potentially going to kill somebody. So he killed somebody. That's murder. So, a week ahead, um, as the rain starts to pelt down round about me, we are still in lockdown and lockdown is going to be there at level 3 for us in Eastern Bartonshire, level 4 for certain parts of Glasgow and Lanarkshire are being touted, so it's going to get more difficult for them, it's going to get the same for us, the same being that we are confined to some kind of barracks and staying there, um, which is why I'm not out and about running about getting to see places round about. So, Hopefully at some point that will return and any suggestions are welcome and if you enjoy what I do on a Sunday morning please either subscribe or promote it to somebody else and get somebody else to subscribe. Building the base is something that I'm going to be looking to do over the next few months to try and increase the influence of what people like you, people like me, feel should be important. So until then, as it really begins to pour, bye for now.